It's time to huddle up. I'm Garrett Seawright. This is the Daily Huddle for Wednesday, August 30th. Thanks for making us a part of your day, however it is, wherever it is you're doing so. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up on the video. It helps get us in, for, in front of more college football fans, and that's always a good thing. If you're listening on the podcast, give us a five-star review, and uh, we'll read them here on the show. Almost to week one and a wider slate of college football, and we'll preview the college football playoff, the conference championship winners, the Heisman Trophy winner on tomorrow's edition of the Daily Huddle. So you got that to look forward to. But today, I want to talk about some teams that might surprise you before we get into the college football season that might not be on your radar, but should be on your radar. So I've got five teams, and they're all Power 5 conference teams, by the way, of here are some schools that, you might not think could be, you know, ranked in the top 15 or so, especially in the first college football playoff rankings when they come out. But here are five schools that I think will be better and maybe compete for conference championships that you might not be thinking about when we head into the season. The first one is Wisconsin. Got a new head coach in Luke Fickle. They're going to be better defensively, and they weren't bad defensively. Luke Fickle is going to improve that team. He's just going to raise the the level and the standard. It's that simple. I, I believe that Luke Fickle is a very good hire for Wisconsin. I, I have questions about the offense because for a very long time, Wisconsin has done – what Wisconsin needed to do offensively. And that was shove guys around with really large offensive linemen. That makes sense. Your recruiting base is really large offensive linemen. You can figure everything else out. And you look at the pantheon of Wisconsin quarterbacks throughout the years, it's not great. Russell Wilson for a year, and then Brooks Bollinger, Jim Sorgi, it hasn't been great. So the idea that Wisconsin is now going to be this kind of, and they know that they are going to run the spread. I wonder how much of that is a, we are going to run a power run game out of the spread rather than we're going to chuck the pigskin around. Because for a uh, going on 25, 30 years, Wisconsin has survived with, I need five really good offensive linemen and one really good running back. And if we get a tight end or a wide receiver here or there, hell yeah. But for the most part, it's been, I need to find the best running back I can and we're going to get one because they're going to run behind a bunch of really large dudes and it's worked so they're going to change things and change isn't bad but if you don't have the ability to out recruit the ohio state michigan's notre dames of the world in the midwest for the guys that you want are you playing a style of football that you can't sustain i don't know but it's going to be really interesting to watch because they've got some weapons they can play a little bit And I think if Luke Fickle can get Wisconsin to play the way that Cincinnati played, especially defensively, they're going to be really, really dangerous in the future. But if he can get them to play that way this year, I almost think Wisconsin is a lock to play in Indianapolis in December. Keeping it in the Big Ten is Iowa. And Iowa was the laughingstock of college football last year for good reason. I've said this on the podcast, and I will say it to my dying day. If you suck at offense in 2023, it is a choice. There are enough playmakers and enough schemes out there to find success offensively. And I think Iowa chooses to suck at offense sometimes. I think Kirk Ferentz is, and it might be a good quality, actually. But it can be so, so focused that it can be a detriment that I think Kirk Ferentz looks at the game of football in an individual game from like a 10,000-foot view 
where he is considering, okay, and he, he's trying to play three or four steps ahead where sometimes it's like, hey, it's fourth and two, just run the damn ball and get the first down. I understand that it's fourth and two. The likelihood of us picking up this first down is only 76%. If we punt the ball away, we'll put them back at the 14-yard line and the chances that they are going to drive 86 yards for a touchdown. Turn the computer off. What does your gut tell you? Do you think your team can go get a fourth and, fourth and three at their own 45-yard line or not? They just play it safe a little too often for me. I have no problems with the flat out pro style offense. We're going to play with two tight ends and a single back and we're going to you know use the run to set up the pass. I get it. Because I was not going to out recruit the Ohio State, Michigan and Notre Dame so of the world in the Midwest to get the best players. So they've got to do something a little different. Now their offensive coordinator, Brian Ferentz, has to put up some numbers to keep his job and his dad is the head coach, so I believe that they will find a way to put up those numbers. They've got a quarterback who's got something to prove in Caden McNamara. He lost his job at Michigan almost solely to no fault of his own other than the kid behind you was playing really well, and Jim Harbaugh liked him. Caden McNamara didn't do a whole lot wrong. It wasn't like he stunk the joint up. He just wasn't as good as somebody who might be a top five quarterback in college football this year. But he's got something to prove, and Iowa's got something to prove. And really, they only have two really difficult games on the schedule. The thing that stinks is, for Hawkeye fans, is that they're both on the road. They go to Penn State and at Wisconsin. So you got to go to Happy Valley, and you got to go to Camp Randall. But 10-2 and two could easily be in the cards for Iowa. I think they're going to score 31 points a game. Somehow, someway, Kate McNamara is going to be a noticeable improvement at quarterback. While I don't think Iowa will be a college football playoff contender, they will be a Big Ten West contender and will consistently be ranked in the uh, 8 to 20 range. Now, I think they're going to lose a couple of games. But 10 and 2 is still going to be pretty good. And I think if you ask a Hawkeye fan today, would you take 10 and 2? They would sign up pretty quickly. The third school on the list, and they've gotten a little bit of pub, but I don't know that it's, I think it's one of the, like, the, the, the notoriety you get for, like, all right, name me the most random school you can that you think has a legitimate chance to make the college football playoff. And it's Oregon State. And it doesn't feel like they're getting the love they deserve just because, one, they don't lose a whole lot from last year. And then, two, they add DJ Uyunglele. And there's a faction of college football fans that believe DJ Uyunglele is the most overhyped college football player the last five years. And there's there's a case to be made for that, that if he hadn't played at Clemson, that he wouldn't be viewed. Like, coming into last season, was he the Heisman Trophy favorite coming into last season? If not, he was pretty high up there. And he transferred because he lost the job. So is there an overhype factor there? Yes. But all things considered, DJ Uyunglele is still a pretty good college quarterback. And he went to Oregon State because the pieces that were there, they can be very good. And I think this is the thing that matters when you look at, you know, surprise teams is how much talent do they have? How much talent do they have returning? And then on the other hand, what does their schedule look like? Because if Oregon State had to play a murderer's row of the Pac-12 schedule, which Laugh all you want. The Pac-12 is going to be pretty good this year and maybe its final year. Oregon State doesn't play Washington or Oregon until the final two weeks of the season. So there's a legitimate chance that Oregon State is either 9-1 and or 10-0 and going into the final two weeks of the season. And a 9-1 and or 10-0 and Oregon State team is going to be ranked in the top 10. 
Now, whether they stay there or not is another story. But they don't play Oregon or Washington until the week before Thanksgiving and on Black Friday. That is a huge advantage. Their non-conference is not difficult. Their conference slate before that, you get Cal and Stanford, Colorado, who I don't think is going to be very good. There's a legitimate and a pretty easy chance that Oregon State is 9-1 and or 10-0. and They have to play um, both Utah and UCLA before that, and but they're both at home. I wouldn't be shocked if they lose either one of those games. I wouldn't be shocked if they won both of them either. So while I don't believe, and, and I want to make this very clear, this is not teams that I think, like, you're not talking about them to make the college football playoff. Yeah, I'm not either. I'm just telling you that when you get to the first college football playoff rankings, somebody's going to be in those top eight or nine spots that you're going to go like, holy hell, where did they come from? And these are the schools that I think are kind of in that list of Oregon State, if you're 10-0, and going to be ranked really high. I don't think that means they are the seventh best team in the country. But at some point in the college football playoff rankings, I would not be surprised to see them ranked in the top seven or eight if they are 9-1, and 10-0. and We'll come back east a little bit. I don't think they're going to be ranked quite that high, but Pitt is the school in the ACC that would make me think, okay, like, there are a lot of eyes on North Carolina. And I think Drake May is a really dynamic athlete and really fun to watch. But there is a uh, fantasy football-ish quality to Drake May for me that every year when fantasy football drafts start to kick up, there's one player that had a pretty big year the year before that every fantasy football player will tell you, Oh, if you're not going to take that guy with the number one overall pick in your fantasy draft, you're a moron. And if there was a college football quarterback fantasy draft this year, Drake May, for the most part, would be, by and large, the number one pick. I, I guess if there's a Heisman Trophy, you know, outside of basically any anybody but Caleb Williams, who are you going to pick with the number one pick and the quarterback draft? There are a lot of people who would tell you, you have to pick Drake May. So I'm somewhat cautious on that because generally it seems as if the NFL running back who had the really great year that he's got to be the slam dunk number one fantasy football selection has a dreadful year. And I don't know how many times we've seen it that makes me go, okay, is the offseason hype too big for this guy? So North Carolina a lot of eyeballs. A lot of people think that Drake May is going to have a Heisman-type season. Tar Heels are going to be very good. They are not the surprise team for me. I think pump the brakes on the Tar Heels and pump the brakes on Drake May. Now, I have will have no problem admitting that I was wrong if we get to the end of the season and he's thrown 50 touchdowns and ran for another 20 or whatever. That's fine. I'll eat that crow. I just I've seen this a lot where somebody is that flash in the pan, really highly touted, everybody's talking about them, and then what do they do? Eh, nothing. So Pitt is my team in the ACC. They lost some starters on defense, so they only got five guys coming back on defense. But sort of, they're a similar, they're almost a carbon copy of Iowa, where they've got a quarterback with something to prove in Phil Jerkovic, the transfer from Boston College. He's going back to his hometown. He's got something to prove. And then similarly, they've only got a tough, a couple of really tough games in the ACC where they're both home for North Carolina and Florida State, and then they go on the road to Notre Dame. They don't play Clemson in the regular season. So the three toughest games on your schedule, two of them, are at home, and I just told you, maybe don't buy into the hype around North Carolina. So you get Florida State, who is a legitimate college football playoff contender at home, as well as North Carolina, and then you got a somewhat short trip to Notre Dame later in the season. 
I'm not saying that Pitt, again, is going to challenge for the college football playoff, but I will tell you that I think they might be a little better than people expect them to be in 2023. And then the final team that I've got on my list of five surprise teams going into the season. Feels weird to have as a surprise team, but it's LSU. All of the preseason hype in the SEC has been centered around Alabama and Georgia. And nobody is talking about LSU. There aren't many schools that were playing better football at the end of last season than LSU was. And they got a lot of guys back. And I've mentioned this before in the lead up to the season that there are schools that have question marks at quarterback, whether they are inexperienced or whether there's a battle. And I think Georgia fits in the inexperienced category and Alabama could fit in both depending on who their starting quarterback is. LSU doesn't have questions at that position. They have an answer and a guy who very well could find himself in New York at the end of the season if LSU plays as well as I think they will. I'm going to give my conference champions and college football playoff predictions tomorrow. We'll see where LSU or if LSU is in that list and in that mix. But all of the attention has been on Georgia and Alabama and LSU was playing really well. And I don't know if, if they can start the season quick and I'm willing to say, they might lose to Florida State to open the season. But don't count LSU out. If they can get rolling and not have the slow start that they have last year, because were they one of the four best teams in the country at the end of last season? If they weren't, they weren't far down that list from number four. I'm high on the Tigers. Don't be surprised if they're in Atlanta. So my five surprise teams going into the season, Wisconsin, Iowa, Oregon State, Pitt, and LSU. Those are the power five schools. Uh, real quickly, I wanted to go through one of the, I guess, the you know most prestigious spot for a group of five school, and that is which group of five school is in play to make a New Year's Six Bowl because somebody's going to do it. Tulane did it last year. They got a win over USC. It was a big deal for them. I think the Green Wave can be back there again. So I got five schools who I think can be the group of five school in the New Year's Six. I think Tulane is one of them. They've got a relatively weak schedule. Now, they play Ole Miss at home which kudos to Old Miss for going on the road to play a non-conference game. Even though it's uh, the, I'm sure there's somebody, well, it's to New Orleans, it's not that far. Doesn't matter. Any Power 5 school going on the road for a non-conference game deserves credit, especially if they're going to a group of five programs home. So kudos to Old Miss. That could be a double-edged sword, though. If you get a victory over Ole Miss, and, and that game is on national TV on ESPN too, if you get a win over Ole Miss, people are going to remember that, and it's going to stay with them throughout the season. It's going to propel you to be ranked a little higher than maybe you deserve. The flip side of that is if you get trounced by a school that right now I think is ranked 22nd, it's going to be hard to bounce back from that. Tulane's biggest problem is they haven't been super consistent. They made a New Year's Six Bowl last year. They went 2-10 and ten the year before that. Um, and, and I don't think that's a Willie Fritz problem. I think that's a group of five. Um, group of five, just one of those symptoms of being in that level is if you get a bunch of guys who play really well, they either get bigger, better offers to go to bigger, better schools, or they – find themselves wanting to go to the NFL draft. And then you've got to replace it and replenish. And if you don't do that to a certain level, it's going to be tough. But I think Tulane's got a relatively weak schedule and an opportunity early in the season to cement itself as the school who was going to represent the group of five. Because I don't feel super strongly about the other four teams on the list. I don't think the Mountain West is very good. I don't think the Mid-American Conference is good at all. I don't have a MAC school on the list because 
I don't think that Toledo or Ohio, uh, Ohio lost to San, to San Diego State in week zero on national TV. I don't know how many more opportunities they'll have to impress. And the same for Toledo. I don't know the opportunity that they'll have to showcase, hey, we're really good and we deserve to be the group of five school that makes the NY6. I don't see those opportunities happening. So I don't have a max school on the list. I don't think the Mountain West is very good. And with that said, I have two schools from the Mountain West in my group of five possibilities. Boise State and Air Force. Boise State is a little more difficult because their two games to open the season are at Washington and home for Central Florida. So if they're 2-0 and after those two games, 12-0 and is certainly a possibility, and they would be a slam dunk at that point to make the college football, or to not make the college football playoff, excuse me, to make a New Year's Six Bowl. An undefeated group of five school is not going to be left out of the NY6, I don't believe. If they're 1-1, one and 11-1 one, and one is still likely, 11 or possibility, 10 and two is likely because I don't think the Mountain West is very good. Speaking of that, Air Force is going to play a bad schedule. They play Boise State on Black Friday on national TV, and that might be the decider of who the representative is in this situation, but Air Force will have games against Navy, who is not going to be very good this year, and Army, who probably isn't going to be great. Air Force will have a couple of opportunities on national TV, and they're not going to have really all of the challenges that come with playing on national TV. I think San Diego State is a big game for them on CBS Sports Network, but after that, their non-conference is dreadful. Robert Morris, Sam Houston... Navy, Army, it's not good. There's a there's a real chance that Air Force goes into Black Friday in the final week of the season against Boise with those two schools, the winner of that, looking at the possibility of playing in a New Year's Six game. The final two schools on the list of group of five schools that are in play for that, that New Year's Six spot are Troy, and it's just because they're the overwhelming favorite to win the Sun Belt. And truthfully, is the Sun Belt the best group of five school, best group of five conference in 2023? Yeah, I think so. And if Troy is the overwhelming favorite to win that league, I think you have to put them. It's just a, due to it being maybe the best G5 conference, does that mean there's parity and upheaval and upsets? Maybe. And that could be its downfall. But if Troy is the overwhelming preseason favorite to win the Sun Belt, and the Sun Belt is the best G5 conference, ipso facto, Troy has to be on the list. And then the final one is Liberty. You get a first year head coach in Jamie Chadwell who's going to try to implement his kind of spread triple option offense. Jamie Chadwell is doing things that are just b beautiful to watch in film and watch play out. And it's just a darn shame that he left Coastal Carolina because that to me is starting to become like one of those. I think we all start to pick up like, you know, like kind of fringe schools that you're like, I kind of like what's going on down there. I like the colors. I like the vibe of the school. I like what they're doing. I like the uniforms. I like the offense. Coastal Carolina was getting that to me. Grayson McCall just bawling out for Jamie Chadwell. And he went to Liberty. And that's fine. It's a better opportunity for him. But Liberty's schedule is horrendous. Bad. Bad, bad, bad schedule. Western Kentucky is the favorite to win Conference USA. But they've got a national, they've got a game on national TV, like big national TV on Fox against Ohio State, where I just don't imagine that goes very well for them. And 
I don't think Liberty's Liberty doesn't have that. Their non-conference games are Bowling Green, New Mexico State, Buffalo, and Florida International. Four and zero. Oh. Then they play Sam Houston and Jacksonville State to begin Conference USA. Conference USA play two and zero. Oh. Middle Tennessee, or, I guess six and zero oh at that point. Middle Tennessee State seven and zero. Oh. A game against Western Kentucky, and then Louisiana Tech, Old Dominion, UMass, UTEP. It ain't pretty. So I don't I don't know how good Liberty is going to be. But eleven and one is an option, truthfully. Just due to the fact that it is not a pretty schedule that has been put in front of him. So my group of five schools that I think could make a New Year's six spot, Tulane, Boise State, Air Force, Troy, and Liberty is my last one. Also got a, before we go today, got a question on yesterday's show where we talked about uh, Ryan Day naming a, a starter at Ohio State at the quarterback spot. And I s- mentioned that if the offensive staff is split on how they should go about the starting quarterback and who should be the starting quarterback, that it's really simple to go ask Marvin Harrison Jr., the best player in college football, and say, what do you think? And the question was, from Marcus on YouTube said question for you. Do you think that one of the best politicians in college sports didn't have those conversations? Or do you think it's more likely that he realized there are a lot of benefits that come with not naming a starter, i.e. player engagement, harder to game plan and recruiting. So I think Marcus for the question, um, do I think it's possible that he didn't have those conversations? I do just because as easy it is to, ask that question. And and that was basically my argument was how simple is it to go walk to Marvin Harrison Jr. and say, what would you do if you were me and why? It's pretty simple. As easy as it is to do that, it's also easy to get wrapped up in what you're doing and get tunnel vision and think, I got to make a decision. I got to make a decision. The team deserves a decision. I think Ryan Day has shown that he's a good CEO. But to pretend as if he's not stubborn at times wouldn't be reality either. There have been times where Ohio State has stuck to a game plan where it wasn't necessarily working or they've stuck with a scheme that wasn't necessarily working or they've stuck with a coordinator where it wasn't necessarily working. For instance, last year in the season opener against Notre Dame, big game, they won 21 to 10 because by God, Ryan Day was going to show America that Ohio State can run the football we're going to power run game this. And it was just like, okay, well, why, why is that the decision? And why aren't you where you want to be in the passing game yet with a Heisman trophy and first round Heisman trophy, hopeful and a first round quarterback at times, Ohio, the, a knock on Ryan day is that Ohio state calls too many screen passes. They just catch the snap and chuck it to an outside wide receiver. Well, if the defense is going to give you that you're dumb to not take it, but there have been times where those schemes and those decisions and the way they want to play a bit him in the ass too, where Georgia takes a lead in a college football playoff semifinal because of the way you were playing defensively. So to pretend as if Ryan day isn't stubborn and doesn't get laser focused in on things too, I don't think is unreasonable to point out. Generally, Ohio State's mission going into a game is we are going to do whatever it takes to win the game. I don't necessarily care what the perception is or what how people view it. As long as we put a W in the column, I don't care how we get it done. And that's I I appreciate that. But at times, Ryan Day teams, Ryan Day as a play caller, Ryan Day as a CEO of that program, gets tunnel vision and says, this is what we're going to do. I don't care what we have to do. This is what we're going to do. So is it unreasonable to think that he got wrapped up in that? No, I don't think so. I think generally he's got a pretty good feel of what his players think and what is in the best interest of them. And I imagine that they've probably fostered a relationship that isn't difficult for them to share how they feel with Ryan Day. And I think that's a good thing. But do I think I think it can be both. I think he he realizes that there are some benefits of not definitively naming a starter going into week one. The problem is, is you play a conference game to start. If Ohio State was playing 
if their schedule was jumbled up and instead of playing Indiana to start the season, they were playing Western Kentucky or Youngstown State to start the season, I think the decision might be different. I'm, I think it might because the announcement is Devin Brown is going to play. How much he plays, what his opportunities are, et cetera, we'll see. But I think if that season opening game wasn't against a power five opponent in your conference who was going to know you really well, it might be a different story and it might be a different decision. Undeniably, of not naming a starter until yesterday. That'll do it for today's edition of the Daily Huddle. Certainly, thank you for making us a part of your day, however it is, wherever it is you're doing so. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up. If you're on the podcast, drop a five-star review, and we'll read them here on the show. Again, that's today's edition of the Daily Huddle. Tomorrow, conference champions and college football playoff and national championship predictions. You got that to look forward to as we inch closer and closer to the real kickoff for all college football teams on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. It'll be a fun Labor Day weekend. We'll be right here to chat with you on Saturday Glory. This has been today's Daily Huddle.